It's good. I like it. Right? Carry on. And then we were, um, we lived with the producer from Killing Is My Business. His name is Carrot Fay. And because me and Dave were homeless. And uh, so we basically moved into his place. And then he didn't pay the electric bill, so the lights got turned off. And um, I had this bass. Remember that? I had this BC Rich Eagle bass that had the frets ripped out of it. And Dave picked the bass up. He was playing and he starts playing basically what became the P-Cells riff, you know. Um, and he said, hey, Junior, come here. Check this out. And he played it and, you know, learned it. And we would go to rehearsal that day. And um, that song pretty much wrote itself in the band room. I'll let you expand on it because it yeah, that song, just happened. That song like was up in the ether, man, and um, it just came together. That that was a like ten minutes, and and I think um, Gar shortened the arrangement. He did. It yeah, it was like seven minutes long. And Gar said, "Man, this is too long," and that was it. It was done. It was a hit song. Yeah, really just wrote itself in the room. And as did a lot of the songs over the years, Symphony of Destruction, In My Darkest Hour, Sweating Bullets, you know, a lot of the songs that became the hits, they just kind of fall out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, your, yeah, but the real hard shit, Dave wrote that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were recording the actual song, did, we, did you already know that would be the title of the album? You know... Okay, so Combat Records, when we turned the record in, they wanted to call the album Wake Up Dead because they thought it was more metal. And we're like, you're fucking kidding me, right? This is clearly Peace Cells. Is, this is clearly the title. Um, we had... Okay, so we did a tour um, in early 1986, uh, the four of us in a motorhome, like an RV, <laughs> driving around the East Coast in, the, in winter. Like January, February, March. No propane either. Yeah, fucking cold as shit, right? <laughs> so we played every song we knew, and we played venues about this size, right? So we played All of Killing Is My Business, which took like a half hour, all right? And then we played, we had already written, basically we had written Peace Cells, but it hadn't come out, and of course there was no YouTube then, so you could play new songs without fucking everybody hearing what it airs, right? So we would play the songs, you know, Devil's Island and Black Friday, and we knew when we started Peace Cells, Gar would start with the kick drum, right? And then I'd play the bass, and then dug out, because it was such a different tempo from all the other songs in the set, and we knew this, this is a hit. This song is going to be a hit, and it really was our calling card, and when we... We're on that tour. Um, Tim Carr from Capitol Records came down. We had our agent, Andy Summers, and he really was, he was the fifth Beatle of Megadeth. I mean, he really was. He was the guy who picked up the <laughs> really shitty killing is my business tour. He stepped in and kind of pulled it together for us. He booked us some dates with Motorhead and Wendy Williams and, you know, kept us working. And um, she really liked David. She did, actually. <laughs> yeah, me and Wendy had a thing. It was. Let's hear it for Wendy. It, it was just in the hallway. Please, please. Should have gotten closer with her, but I think she. But I think she was with Lemmy, so it was off limits. So I couldn't do that, you know. But uh, she was very sweet, actually. Um, but so as we did this tour, uh, we knew this song was going to be hit. But we, me and Dave and Andy Summers, we sat at a place in New York City. So Tim Carr comes down to Irving Plaza, sees us play. And he would ultimately be the one to sign us to Capitol Records a few months later. But we, me and Dave and Andy went to... Now let me go last. <laughs> Let's not start with Jeff. Go Chris. Yeah, it's probably Good Morning Black Friday. Yeah. But it's so close. There's, I mean, all of them are really, you know, I mean, peace sells, but... But as far as just a great song that, like, the beginning is so just dark and and as it progresses, it just gets so heavy that that's that and The Conjuring. It's pretty memorable. Yeah. David? My favorite one to play is My Last Words. 
just because the bass riff is so fun. Yeah, that's right? awesome. And it's really not even hard to play. It's just, it's just, you know, it's just like a sewing machine, you know? It just, <laughs> just keeps going, right? It's just a pentatonic riff. But probably my favorite song on the record, and it was one of the very first songs Dave had when I met him, uh, is Devil's Island. And it was called, um, I think it was called... Zappian. Pa yeah, it was about Papillon. He wrote it about the movie we were watching. We were all stoned watching Papillon one night and wrote the song about that, basically, right? Um, but it, I think the original song was called Eye for an Eye. That was the original title of that. And um, and it, it was slower. It was really slow. It was, And it had another little riff in it. It was... That pull off off the E... To e E A B or E E D B A dun dig dun dig 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 dun dig dun dig 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 and then once we sped it up, yeah. couldn't fucking play that part in there anymore. But it was a really cool riff, and you know, when we first met and started the band, this, those tempos were really slow. You know that that even skull beneath the skin was like dun dig dig dun dun dig dun dig dig dun dun dig dun right so. Even as we started Kings of Thrash, that was one of our goals that, you know, Jeff really, he really was the mechanic to rip these songs apart and deep dive into them and really pull them apart to get the swagger and the groove and everything. Because the songs were written much slower and then they ended up being a lot faster when we recorded, probably with P-Cells too, right? I think, maybe? can't remember where Temple's were. Good morning, Black Friday or Conjuring, same thing. I'm having fun playing the Conjuring lately. It's a fun one to play. What's, what's the it was boring, actually, when I did it on the So Far Tour, I didn't like it because I didn't have a solo in it, but now I'm doing the Stain solo and I'm having fun doing that. <laughs> so it's, a lot of... it's all about getting your solo in, everybody. Yeah, Bad Omen has a really good bass line, too. Well, it's all great. I mean, now whose idea was it to do I Ain't Superstitious? Because similar to these boots, not an obvious cover. The producer. No. And he, uh, he start, he's the one that said, let's do boots. Yeah, it was his idea to yeah. do boots, yeah, and superstitious. But we, our version of I Ain't Superstitious. I think Gar had a lot to do with the, the vibe of those two records. The drumming led, led, it wasn't like normal metal drumming then. No, he was all, yeah, yeah, he was all over the place. You know, he never, he didn't care where the one was. And me, we had played for years and years together, and from rock to trying to be, you know, try to play Jeff Beck stuff and try and play Return to Forever shit, and and then um, when Gar joined Megadeth, that's how I got in. It was, you know, he joined and I joined too. But Gar brought that vibe. Me and Gar brought our vibe, and Dave and Dave had their vibe, and then we learned about metal from those guys. There's no other riffs were coming out like Skull Beneath the Skin, really. Yeah. I, I mean, just the, tempos and everything. No one was really doing that. Yeah, and just the way Gar played it, man. He made it more, it's timeless, you know? Now, I did have a question about maybe relearning the songs or, or keeping up or going back to them after all these years. But after watching you soundcheck this afternoon, uh, have you ever put the guitar down in the last 35 years? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, I haven't. But, but this stuff does hurt my hand. <laughs> Has anyone heard any of Chris's other post Megadeth stuff? Yeah. Damn the Machine? Yeah. yeah. Etc. You should really check it out. It's great All stuff. Right. All two of you. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it, 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 it must be, are there emotional things to going back to these songs as well? Because it was both a good time and a, and a bad time. Yeah, no, I, I get, you know, when it first started, I was like, it brought back all kinds of shit. But I still had muscle memory, which is pretty weird. To, to start playing the song and go, oh, wait a minute, I could play it like this. And my hand would just do it. And, and that's very strange, because that was 40 years ago. So no one had to reteach you the solos or uh, anything like that? Oh, I still don't know that. I can't even do my own solos. <laughs> You never played them twice anyway. <laughs> yeah, actually, you're playing them closer now than you did when we were on tour together. Yeah, I had, I had them for a minute. And I had them for a minute when we did the, 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 the thing where we made the live record. But man, it's just I had so much other shit going. I'm trying to remember them again. 
Jeff, the combination of your and Chris's playing on the first three albums is, you know, it's nothing short of legendary. So is it great for you that Chris has come back remembering that you were a fan of Chris's playing on the first two albums? It must be a... Of course, we get to Guitar Geek out together. And uh, you guys will see when we play, when we do the show. It's hard to explain music. It's it's kind of hard to talk about, but of course it's a anytime Chris can join us as special guests, it's a blessing, and we appreciate it because that was the reason I took the gig. We had similar influences. We both love. You can hear in our playing Holsworth and Beck and you know Mahavishnu and these other groups. So when I heard that part of even though maybe the metal and Dave's singing was foreign to me and it wasn't really my vibe, because I was kind of doing more of like a Gary Moore, John Sykes, uh, John Norm kind of Euro thing. So that took me, but then I heard Chris's playing, I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And so I've always thought of myself, I'm kind of Chris's apprentice. And so now I get to apprentice firsthand here, right? And then when he's not with us, I do this solos. I that makes it a lot easier for me. I, mean, I, I can't play half of what he plays every night. It's like so we have the master, the apprentice, who's also a master, and David Ellison. That's pretty amazing, guys. <laughs> Monkey in the middle here somewhere. Do you realize what you guys are going to get later this week, right? It's, it's going to be insane. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I, um, as a bass player growing up, you know, I played in jazz band, and I had a really good jazz band teacher who would introduce me to things. So I understood, I heard, in fact, Al Di Miola is probably as much of an influence on my bass playing as any bass players are. They're really staccato, that digga 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 digga. And I copped a lot of that even on So Far So Good Salud and so a lot of licks and stuff. Um, so when Chris would put in, you know, Return to Forever or some Mahavishnu stuff or we would listen to, um, you know, Band of Gypsies and, yeah. you know, various things on the road, I understood it. Dave, that was not his world at all. Um, you know, Dave had a different influence of David Bowie and Motown and different things that he grew up with. So I literally was the monkey in the middle who kind of could bridge the gap between the two, you know. And um, I don't know if it's a bass player thing or what it is, but I kind of, I could, I you know, was kind of that the bridge in the middle to that. Because I also, obviously, I was, you know, Maiden, UFO. Kiss, you know, I grew up a rocker, but I, but I, as you know, as just to try to become a better bass player, I went outside of rock and roll to try to, you know, get other influences. So playing with Gar and Chris, in fact, I remember we, we had a place in, in um, Hollywood called Mars Studio that we would rehearse at, and and Gar and and Chris. Where I got the vibe for hook and mouth solo that <laughs> the real percussive muted picking. Is it like a real Demiola kind of Randy Rhodes over the mountain thing? Beautiful, beautiful. David. Yes. As a founding member of the band who played on every album up to The World Needs a Hero initially, how devastating was it when Mustaine got the hand injury, injury and it was all over? It was pretty fucked up. I'm not gonna lie. Um, like things must have been good at that time, like financially. Well, yeah, we had just signed a very big record deal with Rod Smallwood, who manages Iron Maiden. He put together a bunch of investors and started a big record company called Sanctuary. And they had just signed Megadeth was one of the big signings. Queensrÿche, Halford, uh, they were building, you know, quite a quite a cachet um, of, of metal artists. And keep in mind, this was 2000 in 2001 so you know new metal was all the rave you know it was corn god smack disturbed you know at least in america it was all that kind of stuff um <clears throat> so as american bands it was weird to find a home you know to go next and like i said we had outlived our seven album major label deal with capital which are, if there are any musicians who have ever had record deals in the house even if it was your own record company <laughs> it's it's freaking tough at best, right? And um, so it was, I think the only reason we stayed at Capitol is because we made the money. I mean, the people who signed us were long gone, you know, and it's just a Monday morning, Monday morning they look at who made money. Okay, you get to stay. I mean, it's really, it's that simple in the record business world. So, um, you know, we had just signed this deal. We did the, the World Needs a Hero, did this big tour, and then um, 
you know, for the band to be ended, you know, and uh, Dave called me up and he said he quit. And uh, and it was just like, it had to be crazy. It was, yeah, it, 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 it was it was a weird moment because you're like, well, wait a minute, what are we gonna do? Because we it's a business as well, right? So you're doing that. And of course I was like, the weird thing was Al Petrelli on that tour, he asked me if I wanted to go play with trans Orchestra that year. Oh. And I really did, because I love TSO. I love those records. And I said, I said, dude, I gotta, I gotta relax, man. We've been on the road all year. We've been on the road for about three years straight. And I was like, I just gotta relax. And then, <laughs> then the following February, Dave calls him, the band's over, you know? So it was just kind of a lot of one, two punches. And, um, you know, I think for me, my family was very young, so I'm the breadwinner of my family. So, um, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, what's the next step now? It's a bad time in your life to have your, your career yeah, divert, you know? Um, and, you know, look, opportunities open, and I, I, you know, carried on. I mean, that really taught me to just always be resourceful and just to just be a survivor, you know? And I think even during that whole decade of the 2000s, that's what I did. You know, I had several bands, I played on a lot of records, Max Cavalera, Soulfly, whatever. I put new bands together. Um, I mean, I've had 20, 30 bands in my life, you know? A couple of them have been really successful, a couple of them marginally successful, some of them, eh, eh, you know? I mean, welcome to the music business, right? But. Um, even when I went back to Megadeth in 2010, um, I learned it's like, don't ever put your eggs all back in one basket again, you know? And, um, you know, that's why, you know, I was just with my friend KK Downing, um, and he's got KK's Priest, you know? And it was. Let's hear for KK Downing. KK, absolutely, right? And, you know, to see him, you know, he took some 10 years off, whatever, and he's got guitar back in his hand. He's back out rocking, doing what he's born and what we want to see him do, be on stage and playing. Um, and I, you know, I am that guy, you know, and I've done that. And it just made me realize it's like there's two ways to lose, quit or die, right? And if you don't quit and you don't die, stay in the game, keep playing, you know? And I think that's where Jeff and I reconnected. You know, Jeff went through his own life transitions and different things, and you know, we met through the Nick Menza documentary that we're putting together, which I finally saw. There's a final edit finally <laughs> that thing to come out, but we reconnected through that. Um, I think he even called you to be in the behind the music for the Megadeth behind the music somehow. Yeah, that was years ago. So Jeff and I had kind of sidebarred and you know been connected and. Uh, so for us to get back on stage, Chris and I had had been, you know, had stayed in touch for, for all, over all the years. So, um, you know, the music business is a relationship business. It's, it's less about music. It's more about relationships, you know, be available when the phone rings, be be visible so people know you're around. You know, the, like when Overkill called me to go to South America back in April, you know, we're friends. Overkill was on the Peace Cell store. They, they were our right, support right, band. Right. So we're friends, and so. And the first show I ever played with Megadeth, Chris. It leads, Carson. leads, yeah, it leads. England. So you how's know, the memory on these gentlemen, by the way? Everybody, they remember their first gigs together. Come on. Drugs be damned. <laughs> David, did it ever get to a point in those years where you were thinking, uh, I might have to start painting houses here? Did it ever? I, I never, I never, never fortunately was financially in that position, but you know. I, uh, you know, you look at that happening, you know, when suddenly the guy from whatever famous band is the painter of your house, go, wait a minute, aren't you the drummer from so-and-so? I just saw on MTV, you know, you hear these stories all the time. And um, I'm fortunate that that wasn't that, um, that, you know, I'd saved my money, I invested my money, but, you know, look, anything can happen, you know, I mean, stock markets crash, <laughs> you know, shit happens. And yeah, suddenly... but you adapted to, you know, you got out there and played with who you David's mantra is always, an artist in motion stays, stays in motion, in motion. Yeah. an artist at rest. That's Sir Isaac's, Sloth, that's you know. Sir Isaac's uh, law of gravity, right? Isn't it? An, 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 an object in motion stays in motion. Yeah, yeah, it's something. Rest, yeah. Stays around. And I think it's true. It's not know? bring gravity. No, yeah, or whatever it is, the motion around. It's, it's just as things move, you stay in motion. As soon as you sort of get off the road, or you, and, it's, and it's one thing to take a break and be kind to yourself, but, um, you know, music is a gift. We're lucky that we get to play it. Our bills are paid. 
um, sometimes barely, sometimes handsomely, you know, that's beyond our control. But, um, you know, to just be able to play, I mean, I think every one of them, I have my KISS t-shirt on, go, fuck, I want to do what KISS does, you know what I mean? And now I do, I get to do that, you know, so that's, you just keep going. Now, speaking of choices and decisions, does it ever pop into your head occasionally what could have been or what would have happened if you did end up in Metallica in 86? So, you know, it's interesting. We, we were on a tour. Remember, Chris, we were together. We, were, we played with Motorhead. We did, there were supposed to be those five shows that we did, and, and we played in Oakland at the Kaiser uh, Auditorium. Yeah, and Lars, show. yeah, Lars, no, it was with Motorhead. Lars came down, I know the one you're talking about. We did, we did do one in Oakland, uh, or in um, San Francisco, um, on New Year's of 85, yeah, yeah, 86. Yeah. And then so fast forward, uh, not even a year later, uh, the unfortunate bus accident happened with Cliff, Lars came down, um, and, you know, there was just, we were just being friends, you know, talking about it, there was, they didn't offer the gig to me or anything. Um, but, you know, fast forward to 20, 2001, we just recorded the uh, World Needs a Hero, and um, Dave called me, and uh, he said, he goes, hey, Lars called me, and you're on a short list and asked if it would be okay if they reach out to you. And, and Dave said, he goes, there's no way I could stop you from that opportunity. You have my blessing. I gave Lars my blessing. Now they never called me. Um, and I think they have the right man for the job with Robert. Robert's fucking great. He's amazing. And I'll tell you what, it's the first time I sat down and really boned down and learning some Metallica songs and not kill them all and ride the lightning which was more similar to what we yeah. were doing in Megadeth but the later stuff even the Black Album and just really played the bass lines and listened to how James put his phrasing of the of the vocals over top of the riff it was like a whole other genre yeah, yeah. it was shocking how different it was and I, I actually had to ask myself to go I wonder if I'm my mind I'd be the right guy for this you know <laughs> and um <laughs> You know, not that I would say no, because what do we do? We say yes, right? That's the lesson of the day, say yes. And um, But it really was an eye-opener to me of how di their music had transitioned from the early days. And they'd had great producers with Bob Rock. You know, they were able to make very expensive albums and take the time to write and really dig deep and, you know, make, you know, records like they did with the Black Album and stuff. But it really taught me how different they were from what I was used to doing in Megadeth and, you know, working with Dave and how he would write and how he would put his phrasing of his, of his, of his vocals over top. Because, I mean, let's face it, when the singers start singing, that's who we listen to, right? Whether it's Dave or Paul Stanley or Bruce Dickinson or Ronnie Dio, the riffs could be awesome, but when the singers start singing, whether you're a girl or a guy or whatever, you fucking listen to the singer, you know what I mean? So the, the vocal delivery... You know, and it was look, it was my idea for Dave to be the singer in Megadeth. I was the one that said, go, dude, you gotta sing, you know? And because he was writing the stuff at that time, and I said, There's no one who's gonna come in here and sing that shit the way you're hearing it, the way you're feeling it. You're never gonna be able to teach anyone how to do that. How the fuck could he sing and play that shit? I know, that's exactly so and that's sort of what yeah. Dave said to Hetfield a couple of years earlier. You should sing. Yeah, yeah. You should sing, yeah, yeah. So it's uh you know, and you think about it, we kind of watched James become a guitar player right before our very eyes, because as I understand, he was kind of mostly the singer, a bit of a guitar player, and then he developed that whole style of everything that he did. And, and you know, me and Chris would always say, man, their Metallica's clean tone was, but there was rolling jazz choruses yeah, and their yeah. clean tones that they got in those records. That is like the best freaking heavy metal clean tone ever, ever. It's just so freaking good. Master of Puppets is my favorite Metallica record out of all of them. I love that record. Well, I think in the end of the day, we can all agree that both yourself and Robert are amazing bass players, but I can't really see you doing that crab walk. <laughs> That's his deal. That's, That's his, his deal. deal. <laughs> no, Robert's great. I've gone to see a few of their stadium shows. I mean, Robert's amazing. You know, he's he's great. And, um, you know, it's you know it's funny. We I, I've had the discussions with Lars even, you know, just about how bands operate when you're in the room and, you know, you know, you, you know, bands look like one thing. Like I'd see Kiss, go, oh man, the four of them, they're big, equal superheroes, and maybe they were in the beginning, but then after a while they weren't, and you know, <laughs> shit changes, and uh, who's writing the songs, who's making more money, you know. And to this track, Bridges Burned, right, that he and I started demoing for Rust in Peace, right? 
He goes, I totally remember that song. We've got to get in a room and work that up. So that's how it started. We demoed four originals, and we've got an album written now, but there's an ultimate jam that happens at the Whiskey, a go-go on the Sunset Strip, and every two weeks they have a different theme. One week's Van Halen, remember I did the Randy Rhodes, they did a Ukraine, Women of the 80s, and it was actually the, the Ukraine theme night, a band got up and did a system of a down tune and a mosh pit broke out at the whiskey, which is prohibited. <laughs> Two weeks later, the theme was the big four, right? So I go, okay, I see where this is going. They called me, you want to do the Megadeth? And I said, well, I'm writing with David. He lived in Arizona. You want me to call him, see if he'll fly out to do the jam? He did. We took it as another opportunity to do some more writing and demoing. They match made us with Chaz, the ultimate jam people. We had never met him, played with him. We didn't even know if he could do this. We knew he was in a Soundgarden tribute, and you can probably see why. <laughs> and, uh, and he's also in a Megadeth tribute called Woke Up Dead. So the gal who puts all the musicians together, because there can be anywhere from 75, 100 musicians on and off the stage, matched us with Chaz. We rehearsed upstairs while the band downstairs was blasting. So we couldn't hear what we were doing. We went down and did it with a different drummer. And uh, it hit all the news media, all the publications picked it up, the videos and whatnot, and then that's where the idea was born. Uh, the manager, David's manager, you guys got to take this on the road. You got to do Killing, you got to do So Far in Their Entirety, guys, what are you doing? You got to do this. Okay, well, we had Chaz, and then I ended up watching uh, some of the other videos, and Fred, we didn't actually see him play that night, but he did The Slayer. And I saw the video, and I go, there's our drummer right there. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the manager tried to force another former Megadeth member, and we actually even auditioned him, and there was no way it was going to happen. Guy couldn't get through the first tune. And I'm telling you, there's no one else that I, I can think of that could play as close to Gar and Crystal. This I'm taking this out of Chris's mouth. And the Nick Menza chops, because we do some of the, the later Megadeth and Chuck the way Fred does, and, and uh, just a brutal drummer. Just Fred, 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 Fred. He Fred, earned Fred, the name, Fred, 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 come on. He earned the name of Peruvian Hammer. Yes, 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 yes. Guys, can we just briefly hear from you how it is playing with these legends and what Peace Cells meant to you when you discovered it, or? Yes, sir. P, uh, P Cells is my favorite Megadeth album. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I, I like uh, I like a ton of them. I like Countdown. I like So Far So Good. So what I like, uh, Rest in Peace. But P Cells, to me, is just uh, it's just the perfect blend of like musicianship and just evil badassery and just uh, getting getting to play uh, getting to play with these guys, these fine musicians. I, I, one the the night that it really hit me was the the first time we played the whiskey. And I used to like I was I used to learn the Wake Up Dead solos and and the part where where I, I do Dave solo where I trace with you, and I'm looking over at at Chris and I'm like I'm playing the solo and then Chris just launches into that that second solo I'm like oh my god is this really happening? <laughs> so it, yeah, it's freaking cool and and playing with these guys just an honor dream come true. So yeah, cheers guys. Thanks, you. Let's hear from Fred, the nicest man in show business. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's, it's a total honor. It's an honor, you guys. Playing together is awesome. We jam, we do a bunch of things. Uh, these two records are my favorite for sure. Killing it in business, so far so good, so what? And we just have so much fun when we play. We are, we are so connected. We are just laughing all the time, like smiling. It's awesome. So that's why we make you play a really it. long drum solo. Right now. Yeah. We have a drum solo in 29 minutes. Fun. You know, I will say, you know, there's one song, and I mentioned earlier, The Skull Beneath the Skin. That song, because it got recorded so fast, you know, we didn't have any time, we didn't have any money. 
we had a lot of drugs and we played really fast. <laughs> Basically, is what we did, right? And um, we missed some of the nuances of it. And you know, again, what we did with this is we ripped these songs apart to really learn the details of them. And scope beneath the skin, that that outro part, because it's just these, these up picks that these upstrokes that you do on the, on the chords. And I and man, playing it with Fred, it's my favorite part of the whole show. The, <laughs> this, this that one little section. It's just like this is so fucking badass. It's so heavy. And I yeah. get to soul over that shit. Because it reminds me of when we started Megadeth and we had this drummer Dijon Carruthers that was playing with us, and he was like a big Cozy Powell fan. So everything in his world was like a bucket ticket, bucket ticket, like this Cozy Powell double bass groove, all of it, you know, and and it grooved great. It was so cool because the songs were slower. And you know what changed it is this fan wrote to our fan club and, and said to Dave, he goes, dude, I hope your new shit's faster than Metallica. And of course, the <laughs> fucking the next day, everything. <laughs> so you basically why like, everything so Isn't that weird how a fan changed the whole trajectory? <laughs> your fan letters can change the course of history. So before that, you were more like going for a traditional metal Yeah, sound. I mean, look, like, like you know, um, Devil's Island was basically, I mean, I was like channeling my inner geezer, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that? Right? Oh, it was great. You know, a lot of this stuff was very kind of geezer-esque, these bass parts, because they were slower. Uh, looking Down the Cross, which was called Speak No Evil, was kind of the working title of that song. In a bond, I mean, there literally was those kind of tempos, and that damn fan letter <laughs> fucked everything up and just took it off to a whole other level. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't have done good as a Sabbath doom band anyway. You know, we were yeah, probably yeah. better off doing the way that it went. But, you know, that's why, you know, with Fred, because he's just a real fucking meter machine, you know, like just say, it's like turning on the drum machine, you know, but with human swagger, you know. And those musicians, you know, you know, when you play with the musicians, you, you vibe with, you know, so it's... Uh, you know, we just have so much fun playing these songs. It's fun for me to play them because they haven't played them in years. I mean, a lot of the shit I try to get Dave and, you know, when I was in the band. Two of my play. favorite you parts play. to play, and we had to slow these songs down because you lose all the se the sex and the, the groove and the mojo gets lost when it's too fast. Because I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, which is the home where funk was born. You know, Ohio players and the Sap Band came out of Cincinnati and Lakeside. Funk came out of Ohio. And Dave's sister was really into Motown. That's why the funk influence on when you hear us play, when we come back here for the Melbourne show, uh, Love to Death in the verse. Super funk. <laughs> and also Skull Beneath the Skin, the verse in that. Listen how funky it is. So when we do these songs, we're like, we want to do it as fast as we possibly can, but it has to groove and it has to have the, the mojo to it, the sex to it. Because you lose when you start like we did. Like I listened to Darkest Hour on the DVD on uh, Best of the West. It's too fast. It sounds totally dorky. <laughs> it doesn't have when it down, da 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 when you It's too fast. It loses the... The melancholy and the whole, uh, that's the best word, melancholy, this song is gone. So we're really careful about the tempo. So when you hear us do a tempo, whether we do the part faster than Megadeth did it or slower, we're doing it for a very specific reason, because we want you to groove. Yeah, and I, I will say this too, and Chaz, move. Chaz, because he plays Dave Mustaine in Woke Up Dead, right? He is the, And actually, Chaz and I did play together. I did a book signing. I put out a book called More Life with Death, and we played at Warwick's is the book Warwick's store, right? War, Warwick's in La Jolla, which is like a rich town. I don't know why they're letting us, people like us there, but there's this rich town, and they're having this heavy metal book signing, and the bookstore hired Woke Up Dead to go play out on the sidewalk to like try to get fans to come into the and so when I was done signing I went out and I picked up the bass and I jammed along with you guys we played I don't know five or six mega songs or something right I think we did a lot of so far we did so far so good so what yeah we did, I think Dark Star Hook and Mouth he sells in Nicole See, he would know, right? <laughs> so when we met at the whiskey, he comes up to me and goes, hey, by the way, we played together at Warwick's in La Jolla. I was like, fuck, that's you? No kidding. So uh, 
He, he, you know, because that's his character in Woke Up Dead is to be Dave. You know, he's he, Jazz's guitar chops are fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, his his hand on the neck, he really gets a lot of that, and it's fun for uh, for me to just watch him and Jeff switch off. You know, because Jeff, I mean, Jeff has learned what three or four guitar players worth of stuff, not just his own. You know, he learns a lot of Dave's stuff and. When Chris isn't with us, that's and I'm doing f some Friedman, yeah, some yeah. Poland, yeah. some yeah. Stain, put a quarter some, in him, and some of my own it. stuff. Yeah. So it's he's got sounds like a law firm. Law firm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're in the Stain stuff is yeah. like just like the record. It's just insane. Yeah. Thank you. I do what I can, and I try to. Let's hear for Jeff. Try to you know clean it up because you know they were high. And they were high as balls, and the equipment wasn't as good back then. We have better equipment now, and we're better musicians. I mean, we've lived 10 lives. I went to Brazil, lived there for four years. I wrote and produced a, a number one Brazilian album for Verve, hung around some of the most... I wish we had a store in Melbourne because then I could come here every month instead of once or twice a year. Do it. It's a million dollars. Here he comes. Check out uh, Jeff's socks out here, everybody. Available at Utopia Records. Well, I've been just like... Okay, I'm out of here. Thanks, guys. It's the... I got the... Last time I was at Utopia, I got the Sex Pistols God Save the Queen socks. And I, I wore them tonight not even thinking about it. And just uh, quinkity. Dave, do you still have this stealth bass? I don't. I, you know, so here's the secret to this. So Gar Samuelson used to work at BC Rich, and uh, he would bring down to rehearsal different instruments for us. And yeah, I had the headless stealth, didn't I? Wasn't it headless and it had the tuners down here? Good, good memory. Um, and so some of those were just loners, you know, that we would use. Um, and then I remember I had that Iron Bird that I used in the Wake Up Dead video. Kerry King loved that. He goes, fuck, that was awesome. Because Kerry was a big BC Rich guy, right? So when I met Dave, I had a BC Rich. I had a Mockingbird. Dave had his rich bitch. Gary, er, Kerry had his, uh, you know, his, his Mockingbird and, and his Warlock. So we were all kind of, and our manager, Jay Jones, was, was you know, kind of the, the hookup of all that with, between Gar and Chris and everything. So, um, but I don't have any of those bases anymore. In fact, the one that's sitting in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the, the one I played in the P-Cells video, we did an auction in the late 90s just to <laughs> get rid of a bunch of shit that we were, we was all in storage, you know, broken Marshall cabinets. But that base literally had no pickups in it. It was just a base. I put some pickups in it and I sold it to, I think Dave McRobb, who was the webmaster for Megadeth, he bought it and then he sold it to a guy and that guy's the guy who consigned it and put it in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was so pissed there was no Megadeth in there. So he went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and put it in and that started that heavy metal exhibit. And they got the dime bag guitar and all a bunch of other stuff. But that bass started the heavy metal exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame from that guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, just um, really interested in that. You know, the the transition from, from you know starting a band where you guys are just getting together and um, you know friends jamming, and then uh, that transition to where it turns into a business, um, and then you know the fact that you've got licensing, you got um, you know royalties and stuff like that. When, like, how did that transition happen? Was it something that you actively had to put time into, or was it something? Megadeth didn't start as friends. We were never friends. We came together strictly as musicians in the band. I mean, it was Dave wanting to start his next thing after Metallica, um, and it was really- Driven by hate. <laughs> resentment. Yeah, you ever seen a band get so big out of a resentment? <laughs> and uh, and uh, I mean, it's true. I mean, it was, and you know, it's funny because when I met Dave, you know, in these sort of quiet moments, he would go, Well, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to go into computers. I'm like, Computers? You're not fucking going into computers? What the fuck? So I would often be cheerleading him from the sidelines 
Because, you know, I moved to, me and my friend Greg, we had moved to L.A. And Greg, you know, after we, you know, knocked on Dave's door to buy beer, that whole story, right? And we hung out with him that night, and he was, you know, telling us Metallica stories. And we hadn't heard of Metallica yet, because their first album wasn't out yet. And we had just moved from the middle, from Minnesota, right? And um, so we, we hadn't heard of, you know, of that band yet. And so, you know, and Dave's a good salesman. You know, he's, he's good at... at uh, which I learned a lot from him about that, about being able to just be, you know, outspoken and, and not be shy. You know, cause I was pretty shy when I moved to, to L.A., you know, being a kid from a nice Lutheran family in Minnesota. And you realize it's like, you know, I still, Dave got me this phone sales job selling solar energy, which I fucking hated. And Dave, you know, he had the gift of gab, man. He could sell shit all day long, you know, because but and I and I learned from the guy that ran that that phone room. He said, he goes, you know, this is good for you, Ellison. This is good for you to learn how to get out of your shell and out of your comfort zone. And so, you know, a lot of stuff that I did not like doing was probably the best stuff for me. And, um, you know, but it, it really was a band that was about, it was from the very beginning, it was about business. There was a mission to go to the top. We were not going to be second. We were going to be number one. We were going to change the world. And I mean, it, it, it was cool to be inside of an environment like that. And you really felt like that was going to happen. You know, I remember when I called home to tell my Jackal Pet stories, but my I cut my teeth on on you know British blues rock really, and then and then just Leslie West vibrato. <laughs> I'm a Kiss fan. <laughs> you know, for my generation, they were to me what the Beatles were, as I hear from you know an older generation ahead of me, just because they made you want to just leave reality and live off in a fantasy, which to me is really what music is, you know, as then I became, I was already a musician, I played piano and saxophone and stuff, and then as I became a bass player, I realized, you know what, this is an instrument that, I remember my brother had Elton John, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and I remember seeing, you know, they were late, they're sitting on the grass, their photos with their electric guitars and the Fender bass. I was like, that's so fucking cool. It's thin. It's just, it just looks badass, you know? No one in Minnesota where I lived had one of those, you know? <laughs> and I just wanted to be the first kid to do that. So to me, even going to Hollywood, you know, I, I was already a musician. I went there to be a rock star, you know? I wanted to just leave my life at home in Minnesota and go off and, and just live it. And my mom... She told me before she died, she goes, you lived a better life not being a farmer. And even though the farmers are fucking rich, I mean, those guys have all the money, should have been a farmer. But, you know, the uh, a musician life is like being a farmer. It's feast or famine, you know, and it's, uh, Chris has been on the farm. I no, I got to I gotta say something. He said he came to L.A. to be a rock star. I came to L.A. because I wanted to be known as a guitar player. That's what I asked God for. Mm -hmm. yeah. I should have said I wanted to be a rich Rock star. <laughs> but you are known as a guitar player, right? I am. I got everything I asked. You got to be more specific, Chris, when you put yeah. these intents yeah. up to the yeah. end. Right? Later on, he'll say, You should have said something. Yeah. I mean, let, make no mistake. I spent my hours in my basement learning records, taking lessons, playing in jazz. I mean, I became a real bass player. Um, but you know, to me, it was it was a means to an end. You know that it, it to me, music was something much bigger than reality, you know? And I think even when we get on stage together, whether it's a small place like this or it's, you know, a stadium with the big four, you're essentially leaving reality. As soon as you walk on that stage, you are no longer just David Warren Ellison from Jackson. You become fucking the guy from whatever band you're in. Yeah, and, and you know what? You pay for that. That's what you want. You don't want normal. You want, you want I say, you know, you don't want ordinary. You want extra, extraordinary. You know, you want fucking something that pops and dazzles. And, and that's our job, you know? And I learned that at age 13. When you step on the stage and even someone paid you a dollar you are there to perform for them. You are no longer there for you. You are there for your audience. Well, you've done a, done a great job. And we thank you for the three music. And yeah, thank you. Influences for me are, are easy and hard. Like the two, I can just say from the U.S., the greatest U.S. guitarist is Eddie Van Halen. There's no argument on that. And I don't play this guitar because of Eddie. I endorse EVH stuff, but... It's because it's a killer sounding guitar you will hear and it's super articulate. But then my other big guy is from the other side of the pond. Gary Moore is the greatest guitar player from Europe I agree. ever came out of Europe. 
hands down. So those are like my two guys. I had the American uh, Pinnacle and the European Pinnacle with Gary Moore. And I followed everything Gary did, not just Thin Lizzy, but all his solo stuff. Corridors of Power is a huge one for me. And Victims of the Future was, I was tearing that apart right when I got the call to go. So that's why you hear some Gary Moore in the Darkest Hour solo. And you, it's right in there because the night before, I was literally <laughs> figuring out licks off Victims of the Future. So those two, but then there's, you know, under that umbrella, then there's so many great guitar players. And I, I always remember Eric Johnson, how he describes his playing. I kind of feel the same that he says his playing is an amalgamation of all the players. So like there's George Benson, my whole picking technique comes from George Benson the way I hold the pick, and Alan Holsworth, you know. And I always didn't, I, I always, when I joined Megadeth, I made the, the clear distinction that I really, there's like guitar players, like I felt like Holsworth played legato all the time. And he never did anything like Demiola, like any of that percussive, or muting like Gary Moore and so I wanted to blend that. That was my whole goal is, can I blend like legato playing and that other kind of more aggressive right hand picking? Frank Gambale was a huge influence when I went to GIT and my whole like sweet picking and the way I pick and the way I choreograph all my picking. Like a dancer, I really make sure which way my pick is going. And I'm, I spent like five years working on my upstroke because I realized every guitar player's weakness is your upstroke. That's why so many songs are all ding, 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 ding. So all I did was work on making my upstroke as strong, and that came from Gambale, which, where is he from? His nickname is the Thunder from Down Under. He was a student at GIT who went on to play with Chick Corea. That's a pretty good trajectory. Eh? So, and then so many players from Jeff Buckley to Charlie Sexton, Michael Shanker was an early one for us when we were young. We had like lights out on eight track tape. Shanker just such a great, you know, I thought he was also one of the best guys who could blend classical and blues perfectly. Not too much either which way, just a perfect blend. So those are some of the biggest ones, Steve Howe. We could go on for days. Paco de Lucia and Flamenco. And then I moved to Brazil for four years and there's that's the thing, I hear American guitar players and all their egos, you know, and these guys thinking they're greatest, like, rock guitar players. In general, I go, like, dude, go listen to, like, Tomatito or Vincente Amigo. These flamenco guitars will dust your ass, dude. They'll dust you. And there's some Brazilian guitar players just amazing. The Assad brothers, who, you know, I produced their younger sister's album by G. Assad Chameleon, but her brothers are the greatest duo in history. They studied with Segovia's protege, and I got to sit and just soak up, like this close, watch them practice to play at Carnegie Hall, like over Christmas dinner, you know, after dinner, and I'm watching these two guys, and you're just soaking that up. So most of the players I could tell you that are influenced you'd never heard of, but I'd definitely say go check out Sergio no Dyer Saji tonight when you get home, because they're sick. Hey guys, Maka here. Um, <laughs> um, but um, it, the song came together pretty, it's, it, it is, it's very quirky, there's tempo changes. You know, it's interesting that um, in when Paul Lanny was hired by Capitol Records to remix the record, right? Because Randy Burns had, had produced it and mixed it. Um, when he came in, he was the one who, who muted the bass yeah. on the ba ba ba. Bass all dun dun diga 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 diga, right? And then the bass comes in. That was just a little mute. There's as I think there's a versions yeah. of, of this yeah. of Randy Burns' mixes where the bass plays through the whole thing because I, I actually played through that. But Paul Lanny did a lot of really great mix moves on on that on the on the P Cells album. Not just reverbs and delays and things like that, but he put those backwards with backward symbols yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know, Wake Up Dead is a song that has a lot of really production, cool, you know, production stuff that Paul Annie did, and um, then that got I, I remember yeah, then that got him hired to produce uh, So Far So Good So What. Yeah, Tom Wally. 
So Tom Wally and Tim Carr were the A&R at Capitol. Then Tom left and started Interscope Records with, um, with Jimmy Iovine, and now he has Loma Vista Recordings, which is Ghost, and, uh, and that's that's all his I stuff. I remember that song was like three different times of learning three different sections. Totally. And then it got packed together. Okay, interesting. So three different, three different, it's almost like, you know, Dave would write, and to his credit, because he was—he didn't really—he was not a musically trained guy. Um, but me having played in orchestra band, uh, I got that how he composed was similar to, you know, a Bach, a Mozart, you know, a Beethoven, where you would write movements. It was, a, comp you know? it was yeah. a composition. Compositions, putting things together, saying, "Hey, have the bass come forward here, play this. Hey, let's have the guitar come in and do this." You know, he wasn't playing favorites ever to anybody. He was really thinking about the song and composing, bringing all the different musicians forward to to accentuate a part, you know? Um, and he's, he, I mean, Dave's masterful at that, for sure. He had his, this thing, too, where he would always put just some little thing to make it just a little bit different, and he did it all the time. And it's like, right there, you'd say, why would he do that? But that's what makes the song. What do you what do you do that kind of thing just to bridge the different sections? Because you mentioned that "Peace Sells," the actual title track, is the only song that feels like it flows. You know, like it's it's not like not slapped together. Yeah. But you say that he would write something, go away, come back, have different music, and then put that together, almost like it was progressive. It's it's like a thrash metal. Album with lots of progressive elements. So, like P cells, you Very know, it's a traditional kind of verse chorus, verse chorus song, right? Which was kind of untraditional for us at that time to have sort of a repeating chorus P cells, but who's buying P cells, you know, shout it, shout it, shout it out loud, you know what I mean? To sort of have a, a refrain that would repeat that was not very common for us, you know, to do that. And then, you know, we, but we would model that, I mean, like with Symphony of Destruction. Um, you know, and, and angry again, maybe some, you know, other songs later in the nineties, we would kind of go back and model what made that song work, you know? So, um, you know, it, but, but yeah, wake up dead. I mean, it, it is, it's a quirky, weird song. I was kind of surprised we picked it as a second single <laughs> after peace sells. Yeah, right. And, they, and made a video too. And made a video they for it. Behind it's, it. It's so, it does not fit with anything MTV. And I guess, you know, the, the headbangers ball, which was the more harder metal, show on MTV, you know, they, they, um, you know, they got that kind of, you know, not, not mainstream metal. It was, you know, kind of quirky or stuff like, like, like up there. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Top track. Thanks. Well, uh, welcome to Melbourne. Hey, and, and thank you guys for, uh, putting out some awesome music throughout our generations. I'm a so far so good one fan, uh, back in 88. And uh, been playing guitar ever since. And um, just wanted to ask you if you had a chance to do it all again, would you? I would. I would absolutely. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> oh, being in Megadeth. Yeah. Yeah, of, mate. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hey, how are hey. you? Here from Megadeth Columbia Fan Club. Oh, nice. There. So, the best fan club, by the way, you know. Thank you, Zeno. Yeah, with all due respect. Uh, you should see what these fuckers do, man. These guys, like... Remember when we played Peace Cells, you guys were holding up peace yeah. signs, or the, you know, they've decided to stop at the I'm end of the video. Extinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my question is for Jeff. Uh, what was the Chris hardest guitar solo to learn, and how was the process to learn? Chris's hardest solo? None of them are easy because his hand position. Show me your finger, Chris. Your first finger. Yeah, I, had a, I had an injury. So I, you have to tell this. This is this is the secret weapon. I, I, can, <laughs> I can press it down like this, but I can't do this. So I can't feel this finger and I can't feel this finger. So I had the first thing I had to do was learn to imitate his finger, right? <laughs> so, but how I did it, when I got the gig, and thank God I did this because it ended up serving us when I could have, I don't even know how I had on, held on to these cassette tapes. 
because I lost the ones of the demos we did at Bridges Burned and the other second song we were demoing. But I went down to Capitol Records and I got the, the engineer, uh, the house engineer took me in the control room at Capitol and I had the two inch master tapes for Killing and Peace. And I soloed all Chris's solos. I muted the whole band so all you could hear was him. So I had the guy make me a tape with just Chris's soul as a cassette at half speed and at full speed. And I still have those cassettes and that's how I relearned all this stuff for Kings. Thank God, I don't know, like I said, I don't know how I saved these tapes. And back in the day, there was no YouTube and no guys showing you how to play the solos wrong on YouTube. Yeah. And they're all wrong, dudes, I'm telling you. I haven't seen anyone play minor. So, and thankfully, the new guitar player gave us a shout out recently. He said that Chris and my solos are the hardest to figure out. But there was a tape player I used at, at GIT. Uh, it was about this big called Morantz, uh, made by the company Morantz. And you could put the cassette tape in there and you could slow it down, like to half speed, but, and but not the pitch. The, not the you could slow the pitch so it would sound like it'd be the same octave, yeah. but like whoa, whoa. it's just like a just the same. When I was back in Ohio trying to figure out eruption in Spanish Fly, I'd slow my dad's turntable down from thirty three to sixteen because that's a perfect octave lower. Oh, I never knew that. It's a it's a perfect octave lower, and so that's how I'd literally sit there with the needles. On eruption, like you know, the first wow, bah, 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 and I get a few notes, and then I just keep doing that. So the next step beyond the turntable, that's how I did every Aerosmith album. I could put on Aerosmith one and play downside one, flip it over two, put on Get Your Wings, bah, Toys, bah, Rocks, Ted Nugent, bah, you know, every album Zeppelin. That's how I did. Then the next step, once we're out of GIT, I got that player, and I was figuring out all Inve stuff off Alcatraz. No parole from rock and roll. I figure out every solo. And years later, I went on to get the gig uh, and then ended up leaving it before I toured with them for various reasons. But love Graham and Bethany, especially Bethany. But, uh, so I already had that tape player, and that's how I was figuring out my Gary Moore solos and the Ingve stuff and the Holesworth. I'd slow it down. And really, that's what I was doing mostly at GIT. The classes were easy to pass. I was getting 90s on my stuff. And I remember my roommate, he was already graduated. And he gave me the bedroom and he slept out in the living room, but he was literally right on the other side of the wall. And he'd come in at like three, four in the morning. I'd be there with Ingve solos on half speed or full speed. He's like, y imagine you're trying to sleep and you're hearing, like Gene Simmons says, Ingve sounds like the phone ringing. Like, you're trying to sleep and you're hearing some guy in the bedroom like a bumblebee doing Fly the Bumblebee. Man, could you turn it? It sounds great, dude, but could you turn it down a little bit? Okay. So when I got those tapes from Capitol, I, so I had that, and I literally, so I had the Killing album. I'd put it in at full speed with the whole band, or I'd put just Chris's solo in, and then I also got the rhythms. The one thing I didn't do, which I wish I would have done, for Kings is I didn't have any Mustaine solos slowed down, so I've had to figure all that stuff out just by ear. <clears throat> and there's an, now in 2024, I got an app. It's called AnyTune, so I put the song in the app, and I can slow it down by increments, 95%, 90, 85, 80, and I just keep slowing it down. I usually start about 60 or 70%, and you loop, and you can loop it. So I literally loop three, four notes, and I'm crawling through a solo, three, four notes at a time, and a great teacher, I mean, this is how I teach all my students, you don't try to memorize the book, you don't try to memorize the, the chapter, the page, or the paragraph, you just take the sentence, and you just get that first cell, and then you get the next cell, and then you just keep gluing them together, and that's how I've done every solo, and to answer, I mean, Probably Bad Omen and uh, uh, Black Friday. They're all, they're just, it's just a different, but again, once, because now I'm in, it's like when you get in someone's head, like if you go on my YouTube and watch me 
jamming with Michael Anthony doing the Van Halen. Once you, I, I have a knack after doing so many different players, I can get inside, whether it's Randy, you can go and watch me play Dire of a Madman and it sounds just like Randy. So you just go in that person's head and once you figure out enough solos, I could, if you want me to do Eddie, I can do Eddie. You want me to do Randy, I can do Randy. You want me to do Gary, you want me to do Chris, you want me to do Dave. It's like, you know, Rich Little, it's an impersonator. He was a great impersonator in America and had a residency in Vegas for years. He was like one of the biggest things and he could impersonate. And I kind of taken that. And when you do it, if, if you're gonna do someone and that kind of comes from our cover band days when you're back in Ohio or Minnesota, we're trying to do these songs as close to Maiden, or when we did Dallas 1 p.m. by Saxon, we wanted to do it as close. When we did Mean Street, or whatever song, so I just carried that on, and I've always tried to do it as close and or better, you know? And if there's something like I hear Dave, where it was sloppy, I, I try to get the gist of it and make it more polished, just sculpt it. Wait, speaking of that, I remember uh, when I was learning the songs, the three of us would, would sit together, the d two Daves and me, and Dave was always drunk. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, he'd show us something, and then I'd go, David, I think he means this. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and he would just be like, ah, shot goes. <laughs> learning. <laughs> Thank you so much. When putting down your own solos, what was the sort of uh, approach or experience like sort of doing that for these type of songs that were coming together? It's totally different for both of us. Yeah, my approach when I do a solo is it's all just spontaneous and and that's why it's hard to repeat them because it's, it's I try and get in the, the song, I, had to, I have to get there. And then it's just unconscious. It's just like, I just, whatever is gonna happen, is gonna happen. If you wanna hear no for no, you gotta come when I'm doing as yeah. solos, cause I do no for no. Yeah. I took the time. But for me, and it's kind of the same, like you were talking earlier, you were rehearsing and you were out on the road when you did Peace Cells. I had the total opposite experience cause they had two weeks before they had to go on the road to finish the album and they'd hired Jay Reynolds, who was a buddy of theirs, and he just happened to be my roommate uh, for a spell. By the time I got the offer, I had moved out of the house, but <clears throat> they had two weeks and Jay, had, I remember uh, to skip the whole story, how the offer came about. I was, Jay offered me, I'd give him a few guitar lessons while we were living together. And when he got the gig, we serendipitously spoke to each other on the phone and he said, dude, can you come over to my house? I'm living in Laurel Canyon. I got a big cryptic job offer and I need your help. I'm like, sure. I was coming back from the Hollywood and I had to go through the canyon and I stopped and went, he was staying in a place like where all the music, the whole Laurel Canyon movement happened. So it was kind of surreal that that's where I got this offer. And I went in this room where he was staying. He goes, Jeff, I just got the gig with Megadeth as the lead guitar player replacing Chris Poland. And to be honest, they were gonna replace Chris some months earlier and they, Jay had played me the tape in his bedroom and it, I heard like the singing and it was just like so different than what I was doing, like the Gary Moore kind of John Norm, John Say, was like, I turned it down right then. But then later when he said he got the gig. I thought back to the solos because I remember the only thing I liked was the solos. And I was like, I was like, there's no way he's going to do those Alan Holsworth, Jeff Becky sounding solos. But he offered me 50 bucks an hour to, te to help figure out Chris's solos and to help him write. That was good money back then. Yeah, to write solos for So Far So Good So What. And he had two weeks to like, have me write and learn them because they were doing the Christmas on Earth at Leeds in the UK. So the first thing I tried to write, and I was kind of engineering him out of a job, he played a flying V and he kind of looked like Shanker a little bit when he was younger. He was kind of like the KK Downing in Malice. So I thought, I'll write like a Shankery, it was hook and mouth, Shankery kind of flight of the bumblebee thing. 
And that solo is so fast that I did in that, that I was re-engineering him. There was no way he was ever gonna play that solo. Because it really is like Fly the Bumblebee. Like it's, it, even when I wasn't in Megadeth in all those years, I never played a Megadeth song. I always remembered that solo to keep my chops up. Because if you can play that, you can probably play anything. Because it's got weird cross picking and it, the picking, it's picking every single note, no hammers, no pull offs. So what happened was I was down at the music grinder and incidentally, I was geeking out because Alan Holsworth recorded road games there. And so I'm down in the same studio. That's all I cared about. I'm giving this guy guitar lessons in the studio where Alan Holsworth did the album that Eddie Van Halen helped produce, right, with Ted Templeman. And uh, Dave would walk through the room and like his, he'd see me playing the hook and mouth solo, trying to teach it to Jay and Jay struggling hard. And he'd raise an eyebrow and just scurry out. And then Chuck would rock through the room and he'd be like, and he'd run out of the room. And so that went on for a couple of days and I remember like it was yesterday. I went to a rodeo with my ex-girlfriend and I was we were on our way home because she was like a cowgirl. We were on our way home and I was talking about moving out of LA. I was like, everyone here's a fucking poser. You're like, there's no people that are serious about music. I was thinking, where am I gonna move? I didn't want to go to Seattle, the weather. I was thinking Austin, you know, because I love Charlie Sexton and Eric Johnson and, and all the music that comes out of Texas. Uh, I was like, London, New York, where could I go? Where could I go that's not LA? And I walked in the door and my answer machine light was blinking. For the younger people in the audience, when we used to have landlines, there was a thing called answer machines. It was a big machine and it had a light. And, so I pushed play and it was Dave Mustaine. Yeah, right? come down to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come down to the studio tomorrow. I want to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beavis and Butters. Hello, me, 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 me. So I went down the next day and we walked up and down Melrose and <clears throat> The story isn't true in his book that I was wearing shorts up to my crotch. He just has penis envy. But I did have like the long uh, anthrax kind of, and I did, did have like Doc Sider kind of shoes on. Well, we're going to have to do something about your image, but do you, would you like to come in tomorrow? He gave me, by the end of the conversation of walking up and down Melrose, the payoff was he handed me a cassette that had about a 20 second roll up to the solo in Darkest Hour. And he said, start here. Stop there. Come back tomorrow. And so I went home that night and I remember I, I had a, I was living on the second floor in Van Nuys and I opened my door and I had my Marshall set up and I could stretch my cord out onto my balcony looking over my pool. And I just was playing the tape on the cassette and I just like sketched out like, just like an artist, a black and white sketch. Here's what I'm gonna, uh, an arc of kind of here's how the solo should flow. And then I went in the next night and Paul Lanny was there and Gadget, the tech, and Matt Freeman and you and Chuck. <clears throat> and I went to the, like if the mixing board is here, I went to the very back of the room and I turned my back to everyone and I just laid that solo that you hear was the first solo I did and it was just like, kind of off the cuff and improv. And everyone was freaking out and they loved it and they gave me another tape, come back tomorrow. And, and uh, like if it was a shorter solo, like I remember I did 502 and I put the harmonizer on there. I was really into Steve Vai Flexible, his album. I'm not like a huge Steve Vai fan, but I did love that album. And so that's why the harmonizer on 502. And I was already done with that. And like, what am I gonna do? It took me like a half hour. I just improvised it. Okay, here's, and I just go in the other room and I did Liar. And, and these were all keepers when you'd go yeah. in? Yeah, just, I wrote the stuff from Liar and then I just went back in an improv. So I never rehearsed with the band. I never played a gig. I never played a full song, never heard a vocal for any of the tracks. I heard like just oh, snippets. Yeah. I know what you mean. And so I had to compose and that's what a guitar player solo is anyway, like especially listen to Randy Rhodes solos, it's a composition in a song. 
So every song I was trying to just make my own little composition that long. And so I just did that every day till the thing was done. And then I already had hook and mouth because I had started that with Jay. So maybe the fourth day I did the hook and mouth and, and then Mary Jane and all the rest. And then I did do acoustic guitars on Mary Jane and Darkest Hour and rhythm guitars on uh, Long's Darkest Hour. Most of the stuff, Mary Jane. Rhythm guitar. On. I played rhythm prime, uh, longs probably on most of the stuff. I don't think I played on 502 or Liar, but all the rest. Awesome, thanks. And I, I only do that because I don't want anything to. When you play guitar, I think you should be neutral. You don't want anything like revving you up and hyping you out. You don't want anything like laying you back. You just want to be like David's an open, open vessel of neutrality to leave your body, right? But so I wanted to be away from the drugs and I could have room with Dave and we room, we did room together a bit. But like Dave and David were the running toxic twins like Tyler and Perry. So you always wanted to room with Dave. So that stuck me with Chuck and Chuck smoked and I hate cigarettes and he did a lot of blow and I hate blow. So and he'd come in at like three in the morning and put his cigarette out right between the beds. And I was like. It's just killing me, dudes. So I ended up rooming with the drum tech, which was Nick, because he was Chuck's tech. So I was giving up. I was sands and, and uh, foregoing the rock star rooms just to be away from that. And I was rooming with, with Nick. So I got to know Nick really, really, really well. And he's like the Cheshire cat, right? And with that smile of his, the most mischievous, right? Cat ever, great sense of humor, and a lot of people don't know, but you're going to learn it in his movie when it comes out. You know, he was born in Munich, Germany, because his dad was Buddy Rich's horn player, his sax player. If you want to check out a, a track Don wrote, Don Menza, it's called Time Check. I used to play it on my radio show all the time, and I had Nick as a guest. Chris was a guest on my show. Nick was a guest, but uh, so Nick grew up on the side of the stage watching Buddy Rich. So it's you know, no wonder thing. he smoked a joint backstage but at the Hollywood Bowl. He, with Buddy, Buddy, Rich, Rich. Buddy Rich said to, to Nick, he said, hey Menza, can you roll a joint? And, and Nick said, yeah. And once he rolled on the joint, he was always behind the drum set rolling joints for him. <laughs> <laughs> and he watched Buddy Rich play for Quite a long time. So, and when you're more time, child, the answer is yes. Can you roll a joint? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, when, you, when you're a child, it's like, like I remember when I was in, in Belgium with Serge and Odaio's son, Baji on tour, because Odaio lived in Belgium. His little kids speaking like four languages. Because when you're that young, you're so, you soak it up so fast, you're not even thinking. So Nick probably wasn't even realizing what he was assimilating as a sponge, just being around that groove. Because Buddy Rich, you know, was the greatest drummer of all time, and there wouldn't be no John Bonham or Keith Moon or nobody else if not for Buddy. And if you really want to have a laugh, go on YouTube, because Buddy used to travel around and he would have pickup bands, because, you know, you can't afford to travel with full big band horn sections, so he'd send the charge. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, any advice that gives to us young guitarists would be fantastic. I guess um, I only think mechanically, like keep your guitar intonated, learn how to adjust your neck, um, practice. But the business, man, the internet's your friend, man. That's all I can tell you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You gotta be half, this day and age, you gotta be half businessman, half musician. You gotta balance that. I, I was lucky, you know, when I went away because of our family's uh, stuff that happened to my family, I ended up going to Wharton, which is like the best business school in the U.S. And so I learned, but what I learned at Wharton was how similar running a business is to being a conductor of an orchestra. But instead of musicians and violins and cellos, you're working with processes and different steps. And that's, that's really the thing you need to learn how to work with other people. 
Like my first thing when we first played, you played sax. We we both played tenor sax. So you're learning in the school band. Like I was, it was third to ninth grade for me. How to play with like how many forty other people that are in your school band, and your conductor's helping you. So you're learning that. I think it's really important to learn how to read music. We learned it then when we were young. So it, it's always there. You learn what a quarter note, a half note, sixteenths, you know, thirty second. You learn all this stuff. Learn about time signatures how to play with other people, how to ebb and flow in something that American musicians, like when you listen to classical music and classical guitarists and finger style players, they understand counterpoint, which is things moving a different way, like a bass line on a guitar moving this way and the, the melody moving another way where you're playing counterpoint. A lot of Western music doesn't have that. It's very, everyone's going gung, 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 gung. You know, everyone's playing the same thing. I, th I think that's the biggest thing we could do as musicians is stop all playing the same thing in the band, like really learn how to play off the other musicians and really learn what counterpoint is. Because I think it's a lost art, especially in Western music. You know what, you, you have to kind of find your own voice too. You gotta be. You gotta find what you do and makes you happy, and just try and be your own, you know, thing. Yeah, I mean, exactly what they both said. I I think that, um, you know, I made a lot of records in Nashville, and those guys can all fucking play and sing, and I mean, and they can play anything. They can play rock, blues, country, everything. So if you're going to be an artist, like Chris said, you you re we really have to find our voice, you know. And that was the thing that gravitated me to Dave, is he was very sure of himself, he was very sure of his voice. Uh, and voice, not just meaning his yeah. voice, but his, his sound, right? He was committed to that. And he had seen the path by being in Metallica. You know, Metallica was not Dave's band, that's Lars's band, you know? And James joined Lars, and that's how that started. So as much as there's all this talk in the internet, Mustaine wrote them all and all this stuff, you know, look, Dave obviously had a huge contribution to that. But Dave didn't really, and Jeff always reminds us, you know, Megadeth was Dave's thing. You know, that was him finding his own voice away from Metallica and becoming his own person. And, you know, as I, I've got kind of a unique role as a bass player because I get to be an artist. I get to start my own bands, put groups together. A lot of it is around the music I write. And then there's other times when I go play with Overkill and I'm, I play Dee Dee's lines. And my job is to be the best Dee Dee for that slow show as possible. Don't be David Olson, be, be him. And it's gonna always sound like me because I have my sound, but, um, so, you know, it's, it's if, if you're gonna be a side man, you really gotta be good at pretty much everything, you know? And, and you gotta be quick in the studio and you gotta really know your way around music. No questions asked, learn the number system, learn chords, you know, really study jazz because when you study jazz, you've learned everything about music. You've learned harmony, chord changes, you've learned rhythms and everything. Um, otherwise, like me, if you just want to go be Kiss, well, you know, I always tell people, it's like people go, well, well, how can you be successful? And I just ask yourself one question. When you're on stage playing, are people coming closer to you or are you driving them away? Because I've been in both bands. I've been, you know, obviously Megadeth, people came close to the stage. Kings of Thrash, when we played at NAMM, everybody came to the stage. I've been in bands where I watched people walk out. And I had to be honest with myself and go, this ain't working. This is, we either have to change our sound or we're gonna break up. It's just that simple. I mean, that's because when someone's paying you to be on a stage and this is, you know, this is a bar, they, they want entertainment up here, whether it's a bunch of monkeys and musicians or a DJ, they want to bring people in here so that people buy beer. That's really why this place exists. It's not for a bunch of musicians to like get a rocks off playing. You know, we get to do that. If they call us back and go, you guys are really good. We'd like to have you back next Saturday. You know, when? Yeah. But if they're saying, yeah, we didn't like your sound. We ain't calling you back. You got to be honest with yourself and go, you know what? What we're doing ain't working. You know, put a mask on, put some makeup on, wear a jumpsuit. I don't know. Let's try something. Dude, another thing I thought of that... It, it doesn't have to do with, well, I guess it does with the instrument in your hand, but I mean, if you're going to, if your goal is to play music, that it depends where you want to go. If you're trying to play, if you, like if I could go and play the Stones, 
stuff like the Stone Show, and I would never have to practice. But if you want to play music that's like really complex, and even before I was in Megadeth, I you know I want I didn't want to necessarily be in a heavy metal band. I was wanting to be Steve Morris, like or Steve House, someone who could do all styles and play well, right? Whether it was rock, blues, flamenco, and be uh, holistic, have a holistic style. And I remember my mom telling me all the time, she said this once, she said it a million times, Jeff, you're never gonna get a girl that's gonna wait for you to be done practicing 14 hours a day. There ain't no female on this planet that's gonna sit around and wait for you. Guess who's 62 and single today? <laughs> Mom was right. <laughs> so mother knows best, and I'm telling you, you're gonna give up your whole fucking life. You're gonna give up. I never went to sporting events, never went to strip clubs, never hung out with my buddies. The whole time I was at GIT, I didn't have a date the whole year I was going psycho. You know, you're giving up everything. Like I tell you, I, I don't drink coffee, don't drink, don't do all these things. Not because they're not fun. It's because, you know, maybe you don't eat the pizza because we don't want to be up on stage looking like meatloaf. Whatever you think. <laughs> you're giving up your life. You're giving up your whole life. For music. And then the question for you is, is it worth it? Because man, I would have loved to meet the love of my life. I know some buddies that met their girl when they were in high school and they're still married and man, that would have been beautiful. But that's not my path. I mean, maybe next lifetime for me. Yeah, you, so have to, you have to love what you're doing. And I've been in the biggest band playing uh, Downington for 130,000 people. And I've been flat broke. Uh, my bro brother embezzled a half million bucks for me eight years ago, left me living on change in a jar. I was stranded in Vegas. So did I give up here? I'm sitting right here. You just never give up. It's like Eddie Van Halen said, you know, if you want to be a rock star, and that's what I meant before when I was wanted to leave L.A. I, a lot of the guys that went to GIT, a lot of the people I could tell in L.A., they just wanted the pussy and they wanted the fame, and they wanted the attention. And that's not what music is about. And that's how you get rid of stage fright for you guys who have, once you realize that you're not there to impress other people, or like, look how good I am, look how fucking fast I can play. And that's why it was no thing for me to slow the tempos down, because I don't got that ego. I don't got to measure my dick how fast I can play. It's about, you're a doctor of music. The people are coming, you guys are coming to, to be healed, to feel better, to forget your problems, to stop thinking about the bullshit, your bills, whatever. You want to escape for, if only for two hours, man, just to have that freedom, whether it's to dance. It doesn't matter whether you're in a mosh pit at a Megadeth show or you're dancing with your babe at a Sade show. Everyone, it doesn't matter what language, whether it's in Brazil and they're going, a mega death and they can't speak English, or we're here in Australia. You're a doctor of music, and we can draw half the circle, and the audience, it's up to you guys to draw the other half. That's what it's about. We're not here to impress. It's about, it's a ceremony, and we're coming for a thing to give you energy and raise the frequency, hopefully. That's why we're smiling on stage. That's why we're not frowning and looking pissed off trying to show you how tough we can be, how macho we can be. Isn't that played out? It's so fucking played out. I don't want to see another band of dudes trying to show you how fucking badass they look. It's fucking played out. That's why we made a conscious decision. You know, every night we pray before we come on. God, give us the notes. Give us, you know, thank you for giving us the blessing to even be here doing this with you guys. And that's what it's about for us. We don't care about the money because there ain't much, that much in it. If you're doing music for money, you're in the wrong business, right? You do this because you can't do anything else. I've been playing viola since first, first grade, sax, third to ninth. I picked up guitar at 14. There's nothing else I could start today and get better at and 
with the days I have left on this planet. It's like Eddie Van Halen says, you're, if you're a rock star, you just play to, to you die. You're, whether you're famous or not, whether you're paying Downington or a bar for 20 people, and we've all been everywhere in between. And we'll keep playing that, you know, after Kings. When I'm 90, you know, I look at the cats like Segovia and all these players that are playing into their, to their elder years. And I go, that's who, Tommy Emmanuel. The great, isn't, is he from here? Yeah. And he plays an Australian guitar. I mean, that guy is blistering. That's, these are the kind of guys we look up to. These, the, the players who have the, who've kept their shit together and have kept their heads straight and music was always their beacon, right? And if you're gonna be a musician, it's, you gotta stop fucking around with drinking and partying and trying to get pussy and all that stuff because it's not gonna leave you time to be great. You need to watch the movie Whiplash, if you've seen that, and you gotta be like that kid because that's the kid I was. And how he talked to that girl, I did the same shit. I, I read Eddie Van Halen in the articles, and I did it to a girl just because I knew Eddie did it. <laughs> Eddie said, my girlfriend said you love the guitar more than me. Fucking damn right I do. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes your soulmate isn't another person. Sometimes your soulmate is right here. Yeah. I just wish the input jack was a little bigger. Shit. <laughs> Well, on that note, guys, um, I'm guessing everyone might want to have a quick toilet break. So we'll get you guys off stage, and then um, 